Hey everyone, in today's video, I'm going to go over some of the new features of Flask 2.0. So this was recently released and I just had a chance to take a look at it. And in this video, I'm going to cover the most significant changes in my opinion. So those are the nested blueprints, the Flask shell history and tap completion, async, and also the way of declaring the method for a particular route. So I'm going to go over those four things in this video. But first, I just want to say I do have Flask courses available. I have my Flask for Beginners course, which basically covers everything you need to know to get up and running with Flask. So if you're not familiar with all the basics of Flask, I think this course would be good for you. I cover both Flask and Flask SQL Alchemy and then build some example apps. And then I have the Flask extensions course, which covers some of the most popular extensions for Flask. It's more like a reference. So if you are worrying about how to use a particular extension, for example, Flask WTF, I have videos on that. So let's get into Flask 2.0. So first thing I'll do is I'll install it. And I actually think Flask 2.0.1 has been released already with some bug fixes, but I'll install it here. And if you just look here, we see Flask 2.0.1. And I'm going to be using async stuff later in the video. So to use Flask with async, you have to use pip install Flask and then use the square brackets with async so you can get the async extras. So just know if you want to use async functions within your Flask routes, then you'll need to install the extras as well. So the first thing I'm going to show you is the most basic, and that's basically the change in how you can declare routes. So previously in Flask, if you want to declare a route, you would do app routes. And then this has a default method of git, right? And then of course you define a function here so I can have an index function. So let's say hello world, right? We all know that, but now what you can do is a shortcut. So you can just say app git, and then this route here is equivalent to the one above. So return hello world, and of course, that's the same thing. Now, in this particular example, you don't really save that much writing. I suppose git is a shorter word than route, but it helps you in cases like this when you wanna use, let's say, a post request. So if I have a post request for something and I wanna have it as its own route in its own function, then I can just do app.post, and this will only get called if I'm sending a post request to this particular endpoint. So that is a nice feature if you write routes in such a way where you separate out each method. So if you have a function for gets and a function for posts, then I think this can work well for you because you won't have to write the methods over again for each one and it kind of feels redundant. So I do think this is a nice little change for that. The next thing I wanna talk about is the history and tab completion in Flask shell. So you can type flask shell to get your shell up and running. And we see I have this error because I have these two or these three functions here. So I'll just make this index one, two, and three, just so we can get this to work. So now I have the flask shell up and running. And if you're using a Unix based system, this should work for you. It's not going to work on windows. So just keep that in mind. But on the Flask shell, now you can tap complete any Python keyword. So for example, if I wanted to declare a new class, I can type C and then hit tab. How about CL, hit tab, and I get class. If I want to define async, I can type AS, hit tab, doesn't appear. Y, hit tab, I get async, right? And it's just all the Python keywords. So uh, for example, stir, let's see, ST, uh, that's too short perhaps, but it does give me the parentheses. But if I can think of something a little longer, like let's say yield, yeah, we see it there. So tab completion is nice. And if I just do like uh, one plus one, I get two. And if I close this out and then open up the shell again and just hit up, we see the last two commands that I ran. So I see exit and I see one plus one. So this is nice because uh, oftentimes you'll open and close the shell and you're going to be running the same commands over and over again. So having that history there is pretty nice. And then having the tap completion there is nice as well if you want to save a little bit of typing. The next feature I want to talk about are nested blueprints. So as you know, blueprints are a way to organize the routes in your app, and you can even use them in such a way to where you can make a blueprint completely independent of your app. So you can use that blueprint in other apps. So by having nested blueprints, you can extend on that idea even further. 
So a, a really good example of this would be something like you have a blueprint for your user system where you can log in and log out users, right? So they can log in with a email and password on a login screen. They can hit a log out button. That would be your main user's blueprint. And then inside of that blueprint, you can have a profile blueprint if you want to have that kind of connection. So a profile only makes sense in the context of a user. So it's up to you to decide if you want to have a profile on your app or not. You can simply add or remove that child blueprint to the parent of the user system. And I'll give you an example here of using blueprints when it comes to error handling. And I think this is really nice. So if you think of a, a time where you're creating a blueprint to make an API, for example, uh, let's say you have an app with regular views so they can actually see something on the UI. So they can just use regular get requests in the browser and see some page that's returned. But there's also an API that is based on the same app and they can use that. And then within that API, there are particular sections that you may or may not want. And when it comes to APIs, uh, one thing that you will run into when you have an API blueprint is you're going to have to handle errors differently than you do in your regular app. Because when they're using the browser, an error message appears for them in the browser, but when they're using the API, you need it to return some kind of JSON object that has an error message in it. So what I'll do is I'll create like some simple blueprints. So first let me import a blueprint here. So blueprints, and then I also want to import abort for example purposes. And what I'll do is I'll create a new blueprint called API. And we'll just say API is the name, pass the module name, done their name, and then the URL prefix will be slash API. So if you're familiar with blueprints, this should look uh, pretty familiar. But on the API blueprint, I want to register a child blueprint. So first I'll declare that child blueprint. So I'll say members API. And then we have a blueprint again, and then we'll have members API. And then I pass Dunder name to it again, and then I'll have a URL prefix for this as well. So slash members. So now what I want to do is I want to register the API blueprint on my app blueprint. So app.register blueprint, and then API. But before I do that, I want to register the members API on the API blueprint because the members API is going to be a child to the API blueprint. So API register blueprint members API. So this should be pretty easy to understand because it's using the same function, the same pattern to do it. But you think about what the parent is in the situation. So of course, the app is going to be the ultimate parent in your app and then everything under that will be children but the api is a parent to the members api and the members api is a child right so now that i have those let me declare some error handlers for example so if i want to say api.error handler or 400 status codes i'll say a bad request and i'll just return a json object so i'll just say um status bad requests, right? So this is on the API, but anytime I go to the members API, because the parent has this error handler defined, it will use the parents. But on the app itself, it has the default error handler for 400 requests, so we're going to see a page. So I'm going to I'll make this simple example just so you can see. So for the uh, members API, I want to declare a get request and just on slash, uh, members index and I simply want to abort 400 and then return just an empty JSON object because we'll never get there and we'll see what it does when I run the app so if I go over to my browser if I go to my main site I see the hello world if I go to slash API slash members we see bad requests right but if I were to put that 400 inside of my index, so for example, let me just get rid of those. For example here, so abort 400, we'll see the difference here. So here I'm in the members API and we see it's a JSON object bad request. But if I go to my index where it's a bad request, it gives me the actual page. So this is really nice because you can create a single parent 
blueprint for your entire API. And then you can create child blueprints inside of that that make it easy for you to organize your code. But at the same time, they still use the same error handling code and you don't have to write the same error handling code over and over again for each one of your child blueprints. So that's just one of the options. So the last thing I want to cover is async. So I'm actually gonna make a longer video on this covering just async, but for this video, I'll just introduce it to you. So if I create another route, let's say a git on async, in the previous version of Flask, you had to have a regular function, but now you can have an async function, which means you can await other async functions within this function. So I'll call this um, async demo, and I'm not gonna actually do anything that's significant here, but I'm going to return something. So um, async done, right? And in here, we'll see it will behave like a regular route. So let me start the server again the definition there so async def for the function and I'll go to slash async and we see async done so that works exactly the same as before so the difference is you can call async functions in here so if I import async IO and then do something like await async IO dot sleep let's say for three seconds then I can still call this, it's going to load for three seconds, and then it's going to return the result, right? So if you have some functions that are async, you can call them inside of Flask now. Just know that the async in Flask is not for the framework as a whole, it's just for your routes. So basically when it calls one of these async functions, it creates an event loop, it runs all the async code in there, it stops the event loop and then it returns something for you. So it doesn't work outside of the view. So all the async has to be confined to the view itself, the route itself. So just keep that in mind. And like I said, I'll make a video talking about async in Flask now that it's available, but just keep that in mind. It's not a true async framework now. It's still just like Flask before. The only difference is you can run async functions within a particular route or your before requests, after requests, and I believe the error handlers as well. So those are the new features that I want to cover in Flask. Uh, I suggest you look into them more if they seem interesting to you. I think the, uh, the blueprint thing can be interesting and the async thing can be interesting as well. If you have any questions about these new features, feel free to leave a comment down below. Uh, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel already, please subscribe. So thank you for watching and I will talk to you next time.